Greetings. Father Mark signing on, continuing the course on the patristic period, Fathers of the Church, Christian Antiquity. Uh, seminarians, um, I'm well aware that I'm behind on this. Uh, apologies. Uh, jobs number one and three have uh, intruded of late upon job number two, or to, to put it put it another way, the customary misery of existence has oscillated of late at a greater than usual amplitude. So we left off with uh, the death of Pope Pius I on the 11th of July, 155. He's credited with being a martyr, but the details have not been preserved. So we uh, pick up uh, this time with his successor, Pope number 11, Saint Anicetus, A-N-I-C-E-T-U-S. He was elected at some point after July 11th, 155, and reigned until his martyrdom on April 20th, 166 AD. He was born in uh, 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 present-day Syria, <clears throat> in, uh, uh, in, well, present-day uh, Homs, H-O-M-S, in Syria. Uh, in, but in his time, it was uh, uh, Emisa, E-M-E-S-A, which is located on the Orontes River. Uh, we visited that river before. That's uh, the city of Antioch on the Orontes, uh, same river. Uh, but Emiso is, is upriver. It's, it's uh, 101 miles north of Damascus. Uh, the uh, population is, is ethnically is uh, largely Arab, but uh, uh, with also uh, mixed uh, Greeks and Kurds. <clears throat> uh, the the Arab the rulers of Emisa in antiquity were uh, Arabs and they they, they managed to uh, very skillfully choose the correct side during the Roman period of expansion and also during the civil wars the Roman civil wars so they were allowed to remain in a client king relationship with the Roman Republic beginning in 64 BC and they managed to continue that relationship uh, with the empire afterward. Pliny the Elder recorded that the eastern border of Emisa was contiguous with the another client kingdom that we already visited, uh, that of Palmyra, which was ruled by the Nabataean Arab merchant caravan state. Uh, we visited uh, their capital city of Petra. By the lifetime of Pope Anicetus, when he was born there, Emisa controlled the lands uh, uh, west to the Baca Valley, and then south to Yabrud, and north to Al Rastan, that's uh, in antiquity was uh, Arethusa. And it was, uh, it was on the upper reaches of the Euphrates River. Under King Sohemus, Emisa contributed archers as auxiliaries to the Roman legions whenever summoned, uh, which they did, for example, during the Jewish War in 70 AD that we covered previously. <clears throat> this background suggests that Anicetus was an Arab Christian. His father's name was Yahuwah, which is the uh, rendering of, of John. It would be John. Although Anicetus is a Greek name. Uh, it, in, in Greek, aniketos, uh, aniketos means unconquered. In any case, he moved to Rome at a time and for reasons which have not been preserved. He, um, as Pope, he decreed that priests could not wear long hair or beards because Gnostics 
affected that practice, long hair and beards, as a means of expressing their contempt for the material concerns of, of grooming. And that stayed for the, quite a long time. Um, and of course, people forgot you know, the, the reasons. But that was always, a, not always, but I, I mean for centuries, that was a, a clear visual distinction between the, uh, the Western, the Latin priest, uh, and the, and the Eastern Orthodox is that they would, um, well, they wouldn't always let their hair grow long, but they would let their beards grow long. <clears throat> Pope Anicetus received a visit from St. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, and one of the last surviving disciples of an apostle, in his case, St. John, son of Zebedee, John the Evangelist. Now, we've alluded to Polycarp a few times. He's a father of the church in his own right. He was a friend of St. Ignatius of Antioch, fellow disciple with Ignatius of St. John. And he received one of the last letters written by St. Ignatius. That was the context in which we met him earlier. St. Polycarp was enumerated as 17th on St. Jerome's list of illustrious men. St. Jerome wrote the following about Polycarp, quote, Polycarp, disciple of the Apostle John, and, <clears throat> and by him ordained Bishop of Smyrna, say the apostolic succession, was chief of all Asia. Now, I, I should interrupt. Now, uh, in Jerome, Jerome lived in the Roman Empire, so he, he was writing as a you know, from their perspective of the universe. And so when he used the term Asia, it would not be the same way that we use the term Asia. Uh, so when he used the term Asia, he was referring to the, the Roman province of Asia, which is within what we now call the nation of Turkey. So they would not, they would not have referred to, you know, like China and, and Japan. And they, they would not have referred to that as Asia. They would have just called that the East, you know, the Far East. Um, so uh, chief of all Asia, uh, where he saw and had as teachers some of the apostles and of those who had seen the Lord. He, on account of certain questions concerning the day of Passover, went to Rome in the time of the emperor Antoninus Pius, while Anicetus ruled the church in that city. There he led back to the faith many of the believers who had been deceived through the persuasion of Marcion and Valentinus. And when Marcion met him by chance and said, Do you know us? Polycarp replied, Indeed, I do know you, as the firstborn of the devil. You have a nice day. Jerome didn't add that. I'm just being this. <clears throat> Afterward, uh, during the reign of Marcus, uh, well, okay, uh, said. So, Jerome calls him Marcus Antoninus, but we would we would call him Marcus Aurelius, the the next emperor. Um, in the uh, fourth persecution after Nero, in the presence of the proconsul holding court at Smyrna, and all the people crying out against him in the amphitheater, he was burned. He wrote a very valuable epistle to the Philippians, which is read to the present day in the meetings in Asia. End quote. So Jerome is saying when he was alive in the late third and the no late late fourth and early fifth century, he died in 420. Jerome died in 420. At that point, Saint Polycarp's letter to the Philippians was still being read at mass by the churches in that area. <clears throat> Saint Irenaeus is another father of the church whom we've alluded to, and uh, he, he's going to get his own unit uh, later. But we've alluded to him several times. St. Irenaeus was a disciple of St. Polycarp. He recorded the following in Against the Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 3, Section 4, quote, But Polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also by apostles in Asia, appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna, whom I also saw in my youth. For he tarried on earth a very long time, and, when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly suffered martyrdom. Departed this life, 
having always taught the things which he had learned from the apostles, and which the church has handed down, and which alone are true. To these things all the Asiatic churches testify, as do also those men who have succeeded Polycarp down to the present time. A man who was a much greater weight and a more steadfast witness of truth than Valentinus and Marcion and all the rest of the heretics. He it was who, coming to Rome in the time of Anicetus, caused many to turn away from the aforesaid heretics to the church of God, proclaiming that he had received this one and sole truth from the apostles, that namely which is handed down by the church. There are also those who heard from him that John, the disciple of the Lord, going to bathe at Ephesus, and perceiving Serenthus within, we met him earlier, he was an, an earlier uh, heretic, rushed out of the bathhouse without bathing, exclaiming, Let us flee, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Serenthus, the enemy of truth, is within. And Polycarp himself replied to Marcion, who met him on one occasion, and said, Do you know me? He replied, I do know you, the firstborn of Satan. That was obviously a popular story. Such was the horror which the apostles and their disciples had against holding even verbal communication with any corruptors of the truth. As Paul also says, a man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sins, being condemned of himself. There is also a very powerful epistle of Polycarp written to the Philippians, from which those who choose to do so and are anxious about their salvation can learn the character of his faith and the preaching of the truth. Then again, the church in Ephesus, founded by Paul, and having John remaining among them permanently until the time of Trajan, is a true witness of the tradition of the apostles. <clears throat> okay, so uh, both Jerome and Irenaeus refer to this letter that Polycarp wrote to the Philippians. Fortuitously, this letter has survived. It is uh, fairly short, consisting of 14 chapters, uh, composed around the year 135 A.D. And it is quoted in the Catechism, as we shall see. We, vi we visited Philippi uh, earlier in the course, seems like a long time ago, but was earlier in the course during the uh, missionary journeys of St. Paul, located nine miles inland from the northwest coast of the Aegean Sea. It was the first stop on the Roman road, the Via Ignatia, for those entering Europe through that part of Greece, and was the first place on European soil which St. Paul preached during his second missionary journey. Uh, that uh, landing in Philippi is recorded in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 11 through 40. The background of Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. Evidently, one of the priests in, a, in Philippi, a guy named Valens, V-A-L-E-N-S, along with his wife, had relapsed into idolatry. So it, it appears that they, they were born pagan, they had converted to the true faith, had, and he had actually become a priest, but then relapsed into idolatry. And since he was a priest, th that posed a major crisis to the faithful. Since Polycarp was responding to an original letter, which, not, which has not survived, this is a conjecture, but it, 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 it's reasonable, as we'll see, considering the content. Um, so the inference is that uh, not he that the, the reason that it was causing such a problem is not just that he left the church, stopped being a priest, and and just took up life as a pagan, but that he was trying, he was doing both at the same time. That he he was still going to the pagan temples, you know, to to insulate himself from any accusation of being Christian, but also still functioning. As, as, a, as a Catholic priest, as a real priest. 
So, which also suggests that he had fallen into Gnosticism because remember for the Gnostics, that's no problem to do that. <clears throat> and Gnosticism is going to be denounced in the letter as we'll see in chapter seven. Uh, in addition to dealing with this issue, Polycarp's letter offers us a, another of these priceless snapshots of life in the second century church demonstrating continuity with the earlier accounts, earlier snapshots that we had from the New Testament and the DDK, the letter of Barnabas, and the letter of St. Clement in the first century. So uh, here is uh, a few excerpts from the text of the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians. Greetings, Polycarp and the Presbyters with him to the Church of God sojourning at Philippi Mercy to you, and peace from God Almighty and from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, be multiplied. I have greatly rejoiced with you in our Lord Jesus Christ, because you have followed the example of true love as displayed by God, and have accomplished as became you those who and have accompanied, excuse me, have accompanied as became you those who were bound in chains, the fitting ornaments of saints, and which are indeed the diadems of the true elect of God and of our Lord. And because the strong root of your faith, spoken of in former days long gone by, endures even until now, and brings forth fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ, who for our sins suffered even unto death. All right, so he's referring to, obviously, members of the church at Philippi had been captured and martyred. And that uh, uh, reference to the faith of the Philippian church spoken of in former days. That's St. Paul himself. You recall we covered that in his letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, praise them for their faith and their continuing support of him in his other missions, which, as you know, as we saw, was not always, he was not always supported, uh, you know, even by the church as he found it. Uh, so that was uh, uh, chapter one, well, an excerpt from chapter one, moving to chapter two. Wherefore, girding your loins, serve the Lord in fear and truth, as those who have forsaken the vain, empty talk and error of the multitude, and believe in him who raised up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory and a throne at his right hand. To him all things in heaven and on earth are subject. Him every spirit serves. He comes as the judge of the living and the dead. His blood will God require of those who do not believe in him. And he goes on in that, in that vein, exhortation to virtue. Uh, chapter 3, uh, he continues uh, in a more theological vein, uh, uh, referring to the, the virtues, the evangelical virtues of faith, hope, and love. Uh, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. He then uh, devotes uh, much attention to the proper mode of conduct expected from all classes of Christians. So beyond just like what I read, just a sentence or two, okay, you know, be good, be a good person, you know, fear God and keep the commandments. He's much more detailed in, in going through the different uh, states of life, as we'd say, keeping in mind that the moral lapse of the apostate priest Valens had led to his theological heresy and ecclesial schism. So that these these things, you know, they snowball, you know, as, as that they, they, you know, they escalate. So uh, with that in mind, moving to chapter 4. But the love of money is the root of all evils. Knowing, therefore, that as we brought nothing into the world, so we can carry nothing out, let us arm ourselves with the armor of righteousness, and let us teach, first of all, ourselves to walk in the commandments of the Lord. Next, teach your wives to walk in the faith given to them, and in love and purity, tenderly loving their own husbands in all truth, and loving all others equally in all chastity, and to train their children and the knowledge and fear of God. Teach the widows to be discreet 
as respects the faith of the Lord, praying continually for all, being far from all slandering, evil speaking, false witnesses, love of money, and every kind of evil, knowing that they are the altar of God, that he clearly perceives all things and that nothing is hidden from him, neither reasonings nor reflections nor any one of the secret things kept in the heart. Okay, it goes on like that, but you get the message. Uh, so this is a, is a direct reference to St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. And this uh, is, a, I think, a connection with uh, the reason that Valens left the church. The love of money is the root of all evil. So notice, it's not money. Money is, it does not say money is the root of all evil. Money is just a thing. Money cannot decide to be good or evil. A dollar bill, or in their time a gold coin, cannot decide if it's going to serve the one true God or if it's going to serve Zeus. It cannot decide how it's going to be spent. So it's the love of money. So the, the, the moral content comes from the way it's acquired, the way it's used, the effect that it has on the person who acquires it. So it's the, the love of money is the root of all evil. So that, that means a, a disordered perception of what money is. A properly ordered perception is that it's just it's a tool, it's like a hammer, a wrench, with which certain things can be accomplished in the world. But that's it. I mean, just as you, know, you, you don't love a, a, a wrench or a hammer, Instead, you, you know, appreciate it for what it is. It's a tool. You know, you can accomplish things with it that either you could not do at all without it or it would be much harder to do without it. But, the, but, the, but the, to attach the emotion of love to it is disordered. And then and that, from, that disorder, from that disorder emanates many others, including the sin of Valens, you know, who, was, who was still, um, you know, wanted to still pretend to be a Catholic priest while uh, functionally relapsing into idolatry. Uh, chapter 5, on the duties of deacons. Quote, Knowing then that God is not mocked, we ought to work worthy, or we ought to walk worthy of his commandments and glory. In like manner should the deacons be blameless before the face of his righteousness, as being the servants of God and Christ, not of men. They must not be slanderers, double-tongued, or lovers of money, but temperate in all things, compassionate, industrious, walking according to the truth of the Lord, who was the servant of all. If we please him in this world, we shall receive also the future world, according as he has promised to us that he will raise us again from the dead, and that if we live worthily of him, we shall also reign together with him, provided only that we believe. In like manner, let the young men also be blameless in all things, especially careful to preserve purity and keeping themselves in as with a bridle, away from every kind of evil. For it is well that they should be cut off from the lusts that are in the world, since every lust wars against the spirit, and neither fornicators nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves shall inherit the kingdom of God, nor those who do things inconsistent and unbecoming. Wherefore, it is needful to abstain from all these things, being subject to the presbyters and the deacons, as unto God and Christ. The virgins also must walk in a blameless and pure conscience. Okay, so a comment here on chapter 5. The Catechism uses this, uh, uses this letter in the context of teaching about the role of the diaconate as having a distinct share in the mission of Christ. Polycarp also speaks about the role of uh, priest, which he alluded to it in chapter 5, and then what I'm going to read next from chapter 6 is in more detail. Uh, 
Uh, but the Catechism does not make use of that section from Polycarp's letter in teaching about priests. Instead, it makes use of a letter of work writings from another father, St. Gregory of Nazianzus. So we previously established continuity uh, between the New Testament, Acts chapter 6, and early church usage with regard to the diaconate. Uh, so there's Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 3 on the qualifications of deacons. So the Catechism, number 1570, records the teaching of the church that deacons share in Christ's mission and grace in a distinct way. The sacrament of holy orders marks them with an imprint, a character, which cannot be removed and which configures them to Christ, who made himself the deacon or servant of all. Diakonia is the Greek word that means to serve, servant. And so that's a reference to uh, Polycarp to the Philippians, chapter 5, line 2. And that uh, imprint with a character, that uh, it refers to, it, it's the same, uh, it means to etch. So the, the root, the etymological root of the word for character means to etch. So uh, think of it as uh, like cities uh, could produce their own coins. And, and they would etch into the coin, you know, like this, whatever their sigil was, whatever, so you knew where the coin came from. You know, it came from Athens instead of Sparta, or it came from Rome instead of Antioch. And, it, and that's it, that marks it. So it's just like that's what holy orders, that's what baptism does, that's what confirmation does, that's what holy orders does. Okay, back to uh, the letter. Let's see. Actually, I just... I just realized something. I'll be right back. Okay. Sorry about that. I just thought we have confirmation in the, the parish tonight, so I just had to check on something um, so that I can not stress. Well, no, of course, that, that one does never cease stressing about. So, uh, so that one one can one can modulate the the stress to a, a lower a lower order of anxiety. All right, so back to the letter, uh, chapter 6, the duties of priest and others, uh, using, this is written in Greek, so using the Greek word presbyter, as we, we spoke about. Quote, And let the presbyters be compassionate and merciful to all, bringing back those who wander, visiting all the sick, not neglecting the widow, the orphan, or the poor, but always providing for that which is becoming in the sight of God and man abstaining from all wrath, respect of persons, and unjust judgment, keeping far off from all covetousness, not quickly crediting an evil report against anyone, not severe in judgment, as knowing that we are all under a debt of sin. If then we entreat the Lord to forgive us, we ought also ourselves to forgive for we are before the eyes of our lord and god and we must all appear at the judgment seat of christ and must every one give an account of himself let us then serve him in fear and with all reverence even as he himself has commanded us and as the apostles who preach the gospel unto us and the prophets who proclaim beforehand the coming of the lord have alike taught us. Let us be zealous in the pursuit of that which is good, keeping ourselves from causes of offense, from false brethren, and from those who, in hypocrisy, bear the name of the Lord and draw away vain men into error. Chapter 7, back to the Gnostics. For whosoever does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is Antichrist. And whosoever does not confess the testimony of the cross is of the devil. And whosoever perverts the oracles of the Lord to his own ends and says that there is neither a resurrection nor a judgment, he is the firstborn of Satan. Wherefore, 
forsaking the vanity of many and their false doctrines, let us return to the word which has been handed down to us from the beginning, watching in prayer, persevering in fasting, beseeching in our supplications the all-seeing God, not to lead us into temptation. As the Lord has said, the spirit truly is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, so comment. This is a reference to the docetist, uh, you know, revealing that heresy was still alive and well in Philippi, denying the humanity of Christ. Remember the Greek word, Greek verb, dokine means to seem. So these are the Gnostics who believe that that Jesus only seemed to be human. He did not actually have a human body. It was just a a, a, a phantasm a hologram that, that, that he, he adopted for the sake of interacting with us. All right, skipping, uh, skipping chapter 8, moving down to chapter 9, an excerpt. I exhort you all, therefore, to yield obedience to the word of righteousness and to exercise all patience, such as you have seen set before your eyes, not only in the case of the blessed Ignatius, and Zosimus, and Rufus, but also in others among yourselves, and in Paul himself, and the rest of the apostles. This do in the assurance that all these have not run in vain, but in faith and righteousness, and that they are now in their due place in the presence of the Lord, with whom also they suffered. For they loved not this present world, but him who died for us and for our sakes was raised again by God from the dead. Skipping down uh, chapter 10. Stand fast, therefore, in these things and follow the example of the Lord, being firm and unchangeable in the faith, loving the brotherhood and being attached to one another, joined together in the truth, exhibiting the meekness of the Lord in your interaction with one another and despising no one. When you can do good, defer it not, because alms delivers from death. Be all of you subject to one another, having your conduct blameless before the Gentiles, that you may both receive praise for your good works and the Lord may not be blasphemed through you. But woe to him by whom the name of the Lord is blasphemed. Teach, therefore, sobriety to all, and manifest it also in your own conduct. All right, skipping down uh, chapter 11. Now he addresses the issue of the Valens, the apostate priest directly, quote, I am greatly grieved for Valens, who was once a presbyter among you, because he so little understands the place that was given him in the church. I exhort you, therefore, that you abstain from covetousness, and that you be chaste and truthful. Abstain from every form of evil. For if a man cannot govern himself in such matters, how? shall he enjoin them on others. If a man does not keep himself from covetousness, he shall be defiled by idolatry and shall be judged as one of the heathen. All right, so I'll interject there. So this is, this is what I, uh, you know, and I, I said that this is, the infer- this is the basis for the inference that, you know, he, he had relapsed into idolatry, uh, back into paganism, and, you know, of course, we already talked about these pagan cults, you know, so they, of course, they have a very different interpretation of, of chastity and, and honesty. And it's possible, since he keeps referring to covetousness and greed, that Valens may actually have been a, a, a priest in one of these pagan cults, and that's how he made his living. And so that's how, that's why he was relapsing. Well, one of the reasons he was relapsing is that is to make money, uh, you know, from the, from the, from the cult. Okay, back to the uh, chapter 11. But who of us are ignorant of the judgment of the Lord? Do we not know that the saints shall judge the world? As Paul teaches. 
But I have neither seen nor heard of any such thing among you, in the midst of whom the blessed Paul labored, and who are commended in the beginning of his epistle. For he boasts of you in all those churches which alone then knew the Lord. But we of Smyrna had not yet known him. I am deeply grieved, therefore, brethren, for Valens and his wife, to whom may the Lord grant true repentance. And be then moderate in regard to this matter, and do not count do not count such as enemies, but call them back as suffering and straying members, that you may save your whole body. For by so acting you shall edify yourselves. All right, he goes on like that uh, for that chapter, okay, and then skip the next one. Uh, uh, now, chapter 13. Both you and Ignatius wrote to me that if anyone went from, from, uh, from Smyrna into Syria, he should carry your letter with him, which request I will attend to if I find a fitting opportunity, either personally or through some other acting for me, that your desire may be fulfilled. The letter of Ignatius, written by him to us, and all the rest of his letters, which we have with us, we have sent to you, as you requested. They are subjoined to this letter, and by them you may be greatly profited, for they treat of faith and patience and all things that tend to edification in our Lord. Any more certain information you may have obtained respecting both Ignatius himself and those who were with him have the goodness to make known to us. Then chapter 14, the conclusion. These things I have written to you by Crescens, whom up to the present time I have recommended unto you, and do now recommend. For he has acted blamelessly among us, and I believe also among you. So then he goes on. So Crescens is the one delivering the letter. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this tells us that that's why we date this so early. The letter doesn't give us a date, but the fact that it's after Ignatius went through, after Ignatius wrote his letter to Polycarp, but Polycarp still doesn't know exactly what happened to Ignatius. I mean, he could surmise that he was murdered, which of course he was, but didn't know the details. So he's still asking for details. That's why I placed this much earlier in uh, Polycarp's life. Uh, so time, uh, 20 years passed, and you know Polycarp did not write that much. Uh, but the next time he gets on the historical radar, 20 years have passed, which brings us to the year 155 and the reign of Pope Anicetus. St. Polycarp traveled to Rome to meet with Pope Anicetus. Because of his advanced age, the difficulty of traveling, Polycarp was in his 80s. Uh, I think, think we'll find out later he was 86. Uh, well, by this, at this point, he's 85, I think. Polycarp brought a, a disciple with him, an apprentice with him, whom history remembers as St. Irenaeus father of the church in his own right, to whom we've alluded many times. So why would Polycarp do this? Why would an 85-year-old you know, make, make the arduous journey? Uh, it, was, it was for a reason. It was for the church, of course. It wasn't you know, for himself. Uh, it was because of a particular issue. That issue was that in the, in the East, where Polycarp was, they celebrated Easter at a different time than was celebrated elsewhere. Polycarp and those who followed his example, which he explained was what he learned from the Apostle John, were called quartodecimans. That's Q-U-A-R-T-O-D-E-C-I-M-A-N-S referring to the 14th of the month of Nisan, N-I-S-A-N. All right, so now, by way of explanation. Polycarp and the Quadrodecimans celebrated Easter in conjunction with Passover, which was on the 14th of the lunar month of Nisan. So they celebrated it on that day, regardless of the day of the week. It happened to fall. Whereas elsewhere... It was celebrated on the following Sunday. So the, it, it would not be the same Sunday every year because the, the lunar month and the lunar months and the solar months are not synchronized. Um, 
So, but it, it, elsewhere, it would always be celebrated on the Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday. Uh, but those who who celebrated it on Passover Day are the quarter decimans, the fourteeners. All right. So, why is this an issue? Well, okay. Turning to the Bible, the first Passover is described in the book of Exodus, chapter twelve, and its annual celebration is therein commanded by God through Moses. The word, the English term, we, we say Passover, that English term is a translation of the Hebrew term Peshach, which means to pass over, referring to the angel, you know, the angel of death passing over you know, the houses of the faithful. It's also where we get the term Paschal, Paschal mystery, Peshach, Paschal. So that took place on the 14th day of the month in the Old Testament, the month of Abib, and later that month would uh, be named the month of Nisan, N-I-S-A-N. At the time, that was the first month of the lunar calendar corresponding to spring on the solar calendars. You know, spring used to be the beginning of, of the year, which is March, April time period. And it would be uh, in conjunction, uh, the, so they would date the first full moon following the spring equinox would, would be the 14th of Nisan. Now, the equinox is the, the twice a year, once in the spring, once in the autumn, when day and night are of equal length. Uh, further details of the celebration of Passover are outlined in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 4 through 14. Okay, so now, moving forward to the lifetime of Jesus. All four gospel accounts record that Jesus was murdered on a Friday and that the empty tomb was discovered on a Sunday. Matthew, chapter 28, verse 1. Mark, chapter 16, verse 1. Luke, chapter 23, verse 1. John, chapter 20, verse 1. They differ on the detail of whether or not that Friday was Passover. Matthew, Mark, and Luke indicate that Jesus celebrated Passover with the apostles prior to his death. The Last Supper, Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 20. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 15. The Gospel of John, however, indicates that Jesus died before Passover because he records that the Jewish officials could not enter the praetorium in order to avoid ritual impurity, <clears throat> which would then make them irregular, you know, so that they could not then participate in Passover. Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 28. And chapter 19, verse 14, and verse 42. So there's one hypothetical solution. Now, the church is not pronounced definitively, so we, I mean, you're, not, you're not obliged. To, but there's one hypothetical solution, which is very plausible, would, would, be, would uh, hypothesize that the Jews of the first century used different methods for calculating the equinox. So, okay, it's one thing. To say the you know that the, the equinox of the it's the day, it's when day and night are of equal length. Okay, theoretically yes. Okay, we can accept that. But how exactly do you determine that? Which day? You don't have telescopes. You don't have satellites. No internet to contact the naval observatory. No cell phones. So how exactly do you figure that out? Well, there were several ways to do it. And it would take us too far afield, but there were several ways. And this is a problem that the Christians would also share. 
So it's a, the Jews have to figure it out because whenever that is, whenever the equinox is, the spring equinox, then the first full moon is Passover. So depending on on like one day's difference, that that could be that could be a whole nother month because the lunar month is twenty eight days. So if you calculate, depending on when the previous full moon was, you know you you have the equinox on a, on a Monday or on a Wednesday, you know. But depending on when the full moon was, you could have to wait a whole nother month. So it mattered for them, and then the same for Christians, since the Christians needed the same calculation to know when the first full moon was following the equinox. And then the following Sunday would be Easter. Okay, so it is entirely possible that Nazareth, where Jesus was raised, used a different method for calculating the equinox than did the Sadducees of the temple. And we know, for example, the Essene community, the Jewish monastics that we talked about earlier in the course, they, they had a distinct way of celebrating Passover. They always began Passover on a Tuesday. You know, so we do know it, it, it's, it is not at all completely fabricated to assert that Jews in the first century had different ways of handling this. So that would be one way you know, of explaining the, you know, why John has why, why the officials and the temple officials in Jerusalem you know, would have, would have had, had it, understood it as being a different date than, than the way Jesus had calculated the Passover based on where he grew up in Nazareth. In any case, this ambiguity posed a problem for Christians who wish to honor the resurrection. Problem number one, which day of the week to do it on? Problem number two, how to calculate the spring equinox or the vernal equinox. Eusebius, another church father whom we've uh, met uh, several times, Bishop of Caesarea in the Holy Land in the 4th century. He wrote the Ecclesiastical History. In Book 5, Chapter 23, Section 1, he wrote the following. Quote, A question of no small importance arose. For the parishes of all Asia, and remember that's Roman Asia, as from an older tradition, held that the 14th day of the moon on which day the Jews were commanded to sacrifice the lamb, should be observed as the feast of the Savior's Passover. It was therefore necessary to end their fast on that day, whatever day of the week it should happen to be. But it was not the custom of the churches and the rest of the world to end it at this time, as they observe the practice which, from apostolic times, has prevailed to the present time, now, that's Eusebius' present time, the, the 300s, of terminating the fast on no other day than on that of the resurrection of our Savior, meaning Sunday. All right, so the second problem would loom large in future centuries, and it would still be going on in the 7th century when we get into the medieval course. But regarding the first problem, the day of the week problem, Polycarp and Anicetus failed to persuade each other to change the practices of their respective regions. But they also agreed that this was not cause for essential division because they both agreed on honoring the Lord. They both were honoring the resurrection. And without resurrection, then there's, there's no point in having a, a Christianity. Uh, to show that there were no hard feelings, St. Anicetus invited Polycarp to celebrate Mass over the tomb of St. Peter. Now, we visited this place. Uh, this is uh, the graveyard. Uh, you follow the Via Cornelia uh, to the southern slope of the Mons Vaticanus, the Vatican Hill on the on the uh, western side of the Tiber River. It was a cemetery, and Peter's remains were there. Uh, now, the actual tomb was an underground vault approached from the road by a descending staircase. And now St. Peter's is, is on top of all of that. Uh, Irenaeus, in uh, letter number three, in his collection, which is written to a later pope whom we'll meet, uh, the first African pope, Pope Victor I, uh, wrote the following, quote, And in this state of affairs, they held fellowship with each other. And Anicetus conceded to Polycarp in the church the celebration of the Eucharist. 
by way of showing him respect, so that they parted in peace one from the other, maintaining peace with the whole church. Both those who did observe this custom and those who did not. End quote. When Polycarp returned to Smyrna, he left behind his apprentice, St. Irenaeus, to study in Rome. He spent a few years there, and uh, as we'll see then, he was ordained a priest, and he was sent to, uh, to Roman Gaul, that's present-day France. Um. Silence, beast. Be gone. Be. Uh, and we'll meet Irenaeus again. Okay, Polycarp, uh, about a year after his return to Smyrna is when he was captured and, and martyred. Uh, Eusebius, in uh, his Ecclesiastical History, Book 4, Chapter 15, wrote the following. At this time, when the greatest persecutions were exciting Asia, Polycarp ended his life by martyrdom. But I consider it most important that, that his death, a written account of which is still extant, should be recorded in this history. There is a letter written in the name of the, of the church over which he presided to the parishes in Pontus, which relates the events that befell him in the following words. The church of God, which dwells in Philomelium, and to all the parishes of the Holy Catholic Church in every place, mercy and peace and love from God the Father be multiplied. We write unto you, brethren, on account of what happened to those who suffered martyrdom, and to the blessed Polycarp, who put an end to the persecution, having, as it were, sealed it by his martyrdom. Uh, then in sections 4, 5, and 6, uh, he, uh, Eusebius quotes the letter which describes uh, the other Christians who were captured being tortured and all the stuff they went through. But uh, uh, I'm not going to read all that. That's because I want this to be a family-friendly station and uh, channel. And it, it really is it's, it's really disgusting what you know, what people can do to each other. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, I'll pick up at the end of uh, section six. Uh, so Eusebius, book four, chapter 15, the end of section six, and then following. After his glorious death, referring to another of the guys caught with Polycarp, uh, the whole multitude, marveling at the bravery of the God-beloved martyr and at the fortitude of the whole race of Christians, began to cry out suddenly, Away with the atheist! Let Polycarp be sought! Then moving into section 7. And when a very great tumult arose in consequence of the cries, a certain Phrygian, Quintus by name, who was newly come from Phrygia, seeing the beast and the additional tortures, was smitten with cowardice and gave up the attainment of salvation. Section 8. But the above-mentioned letter shows that he too, hastily and without proper discretion, had rushed forward with others to the tribunal, but when seized, had furnished a clear proof to all that it is not right for such persons, rashly and recklessly, to expose themselves to danger. Thus did matters turn out in connection with them. All right, then sections 9 and 10, uh, he goes on what happened to them, and uh, it's... It's pretty, pretty gross. Uh, so then picking up uh, section 11. Then, as those who were seeking him, Polycarp, pushed the search with vigor, they say that he was again constrained by the solicitude and love of the brethren to go to another farm. So the letter had said that the Christians were moving him around, were hiding, you know, trying to hide him, Polycarp. Thither his pursuers came after no long time and seized two of the servants there, and tortured one of them for the purpose of learning from him Polycarp's hiding place. Section 12. 
and coming late in the evening they found him lying in an upper room, whence he might have gone to another house, but he would not, saying, The will of God be done. Then it goes on, I'll skip chapter, sections 13 and 14, picking up with section 15, quote, In addition to these things, the narrative concerning him contains the following account. But when at length he had brought his prayer to an end, after remembering all that had ever come into contact with him, small and great, famous and obscure, and the whole Catholic Church throughout the world, the hour of departure having come, they put him upon a donkey and brought him to the city it being a great Sabbath. And he was met by Herod, the captain of police, and by his father, Nicetus, who took him into their carriage, and sitting beside him, endeavored to persuade him, saying, What harm is there in saying, Hail Caesar, and sacrificing and saving your life? He at first did not answer, but when they persisted, he said, I am not going to do what you advise me. So I'll interrupt there is that we know from earlier letters, from Trajan's, the, the letter between Trajan and Pliny the Younger, and then a subsequent letter, uh, open letter uh, that Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian put out. All these, all you had to do if you were accused of being a Christian to prove that you were not a Christian was make the sacrifice to the emperor. And then that's, you go home. But Polycarp wouldn't do it. Okay, so skipping 16, 17, picking up the quote with uh, section 18. And when he was led forward, there was a great tumult, as they heard that Polycarp was taken. Finally, when he came up, the proconsul asked if he were Polycarp. And when he confessed that he was, he endeavored to persuade him to deny, saying, Have regard for your age, and other things of the like, which it is their custom to say, Swear by the genius of Caesar. Remember that? We talked about that, the genius. Repent and say, away with the atheist. Remembering that to the Roman mind, the Christians were atheists because we denied their gods. Uh, section 19, but Polycarp, looking with dignified countenance upon the whole crowd that was gathered in the stadium, waved his hand to them and groaned, and raising his eyes toward heaven, said, away with the atheist. But of course, you know, Polycarp meant away with those who, who deny the one true God. Uh, section 20, but when the magistrate pressed him and said, swear and I will release you, revile the Christ. Polycarp said, four score and six years, that's where I got the 80, age 86 from, have I been serving him and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Section 21, but when he again persisted and said, swear by the genius of Caesar, Polycarp replied, if you vainly suppose that I will swear by the genius of Caesar, as you say, feigning to be ignorant of who I am, hear plainly, I am a Christian. But if you desire to learn the doctrine of Christianity, assign a day and hear it. And he goes on back and forth like that. Um, uh, skipping down to section 26. And when this was proclaimed uh, by the herald, namely that Polycarp had confessed that he was a Christian, uh, the whole multitude, both of Gentiles and Jews who dwelt in Smyrna, cried out with ungovernable wrath and with a great shout, This is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the overthrower of our gods, who teaches many not to sacrifice nor to worship. Section 27. When they had said this, they cried out and asked the Asiarch Philip, to let a lion loose upon Polycarp. But he said that it was not lawful for him, since he had closed it. Well, okay, I'll skip that. Anyway, he decided that Polycarp would be burned. He would be murdered by incineration. Uh, and skipping down, it goes on and on. There are all kind of things they did to humiliate him. In it. So I skipped down to section 35. Uh, wherefore, as Polycarp said, wherefore I praise you, speaking to God, for everything. I bless you. I glorify you through the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ, your beloved son, through whom, with him, in the Holy Spirit, be glory unto you both now and for the ages to come. Amen. Section 36. When he had offered up his prayer and had finished his prayer, the, uh, they, light, they lit the fire, and as a great flame blazed out, we, to whom it was given to see, saw a wonder. Section 37, for the fire presented the appearance of a vault 
like the sail of a vessel filled by the wind, and made a wall about the body of the martyr. So that means slow roasting instead of a quick burn. Uh, Section 38. So at length the lawless men, when they saw that the body uh, uh, was not being consumed by the fire but being roasted, uh, commanded an executioner to approach and pierce him. Uh, Then it goes on and on. Section 39, 44. So I'll go to 45. Such are the events that befell the blessed Polycarp, who suffered martyrdom in Smyrna with the eleven from Philadelphia. This one man is remembered more than the others by all, so that even by the heathen he is talked about in every place. Skipping down to section 47. A celebrated martyr of those times was a certain man named Peonius. That is St. Irenaeus' brother. Those who desire to know his several confessions and the boldness of his speech and his apologies in behalf of the faith before the people and the rulers and his instructive addresses and more of a... Uh, uh, those we refer to that epistle which has been given in the martyrdoms of the ancients collected by us and which contains a very full account of him. Uh, section 48. And there also are also records extant of others that suffered martyrdom in Pergamus, a city of Asia, of Carpus and Poplus, and a woman named uh, Agatha, Aga, uh, Agathonike, who, after many and illustrious testimonies, gloriously ended their lives. Okay, so what all this is. In 156, uh, a few months after Polycarp returned to Smyrna, the Roman province of Asia celebrated an annual festival in honor of the emperor. As Smyrna was the center of the emperor cult in the region, the city was filled with visitors and merchants for the games. Certain fanatical Christians led by an impetuous recent convert named Quintus, turned themselves in in a misguided effort to gain salvation by dying for Christ. I say misguided because martyrdom is something that's chosen for us by God. If we choose it for ourselves, that's an act of pride. And, uh, and you know, if we choose it for ourselves, then it's suicide. Uh, Quintus lost his nerve, uh, but he was killed anyway. The group was subject to the mangling of of flogging and then the beast. Now, uh, the the account from Eusebius makes reference to the Jewish community in Smyrna that they had been hostile to local Christians. As we saw, that was a problem in the region as far back as St. Paul's ministry. Uh, So they captured two of his servants, they tortured him, they found out where he was, and and then sent a contingent of troops to to arrest this 86-year-old man. Uh, so the date of his incineration was uh, February 23rd, 156 A.D., executed for the crime of Christianity. The Catechism makes use of this record of the martyrdom of St. Polycarp in teaching about the communion of saints. Uh, catechism uh, numbers, uh, let's see, communion of saints, 946 through 962 makes use of uh, specifically uh, section 14 of the of the martyrdom the account of the martyrdom uh, first what is a what is a saint okay so the word saint that is derived from the Latin sanctus meaning holy that is a past participle of the verb sanctire meaning to make sacred so past participle means one who has been made sacred, therefore holy. Those uh, who are made sacred on earth are described in the Old Testament in the Book of Wisdom, chapters 2 and 3. That's the uh, persecution of the righteous ones. That's a famous passage often read at funerals. The souls of the just are in the hands of God, and no torment shall touch them. Further, uh, in Psalm 79, verse 2, describes Babylon as feasting on the blood of the faithful in reference to the destruction of the temple, Solomon's temple, the first temple. In the New Testament, book of Revelation, chapter 17, verse 6, picks up that reference, metaphorically identifying Rome with Babylon, repeating the same charge 
that it is drunk with the blood of the saints. So those who have been made sacred in the eyes of the church are those enjoying heaven mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, using that the image, the wedding feast of the Lamb. The criteria for judgment was provided by Jesus himself in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. And that criteria is the corporal works of mercy. When do you see me hungry, feed me, thirsty, give me drink, Those who died otherwise, those who died with guilt on their souls, may still be made sacred through the spiritual efforts of others. Biblical Foundation, second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, verses 38 to 46, which is an account in which friends who survived a battle expiate the sins of their friends who died in the battle, and as they were being, their remains were being tended, it was discovered that they had they had little idols on them, amulets on them. So they died in a state of, of idolatry. So their friends were able to expiate the sin. You know, so this is the biblical, you know, one of the biblical basis for us, for our belief in purgatory. And in uh, the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter three. Verse 15, St. Paul wrote of the guilty being saved by purifying fire. Hence, purgatory. So from these biblical passages, because remember the, the church Catholicism actually is a biblically based religion. From these biblical passages, the church defines the communion of saints in the Catechism number 954 in the following words. When the Lord comes in glory, and all his saints with him. Death will be no more, and all things will be subject to him. But at the present time, some of his disciples are pilgrims on earth. Others have died and are being purified, while others are in glory, contemplating in full light God himself, triune and one, exactly as he is. So, the pilgrims on earth, that's us, and we're still here. Those who die to be in purifying, those are the, those in purgatory. And others in glory, those are the saints in heaven. So that's the communion of saints, the three, you know, the saints in heaven, suffering in purgatory, the pilgrims on earth. Forming a connection between those biblical passages and and the patristic teaching of the fathers of the church, the catechism in number 957 quotes from the martyrdom of Polycarp, chapter 14, lines 2 and 3, quote, in which Polycarp declares, we worship Christ as God's son. We love the martyrs as the Lord's disciples and imitators, and rightly so because of their matchless devotion toward their king and master. May we also be their companions and fellow disciples. Okay, let's see. Another father of the church active during the reign of Pope Anicetus was St. Justin Martyr. Uh, I don't know if I should... Yeah, I think I think just for the sake of so we've been going a little over an hour, so I'll stop here, and uh, uh, seminarians, uh, this will be Pope Anicetus Part A, and because uh, I cover Polycarp in here, and then the next one will be Pope Anicetus Part B, uh, in which I'll cover Saint Justin Martyr, uh, his his or at least some of his writings, he's used all over in the Catechism, so we won't be able to cover all of them, but but enough, uh, and then and we'll also have a change of emperors. The Emperor Antoninus Pius will die, and uh, he'll be followed by Marcus Aurelius. So we'll do all that in Part B. Uh, But so that the file doesn't get too long and the upload, therefore, take too long, I'll pause here, uh, and we'll pick up. We'll continue with Anicetus next time. So for the moment, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.